good morning. My name is Mark Pearson. I'm a professor of architecture here at College of DuPage, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's Visiting Artist Series lecture. It's great to see all of you here in the Playhouse Theater. The Visiting Artist Series is a collaboration between the Cleve Carney Museum of Art and the Departments of Art, Architecture, and Photography here at COD. It's fitting for our first in-person lecture in the past two years for me to introduce Vladimir Redutny. Vladimir was originally scheduled to be part of our Spring 2020 series, and I hope that you'll see today how the 2020 series theme of materiality fits so well with Vladimir's elegantly crafted and thoughtfully detailed work. I just met Vladimir in person this morning for the first time, but he and I share a common mentor, Professor Jeff Poss from the University of Illinois. And it was Professor Poss, probably about the time that Vladimir won the AIA Chicago Young Architects Award, who introduced me to Vladimir's work and instructed me that I should pay attention to his design studio. Vladimir Redutny was born in the Ukraine, and in 1989, his family arrived in Chicago as part of an immigration wave of Russian Jewish refugees from the former Soviet Union. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in architecture from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. In 2008, he founded his Chicago-based architecture and design studio. He has held teaching appointments at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and the Illinois Institute of Technology, where he continues to teach. Vladimir's multidisciplinary architecture practice focuses on innovative design solutions that challenge the conventional interpretations of space, function, and material use. He believes in architecture as an art form with the capacity to not just alter space, but to change perceptions, feelings, and habits. So after the longest lecture lead time ever, we've been planning this lecture, I think, for almost four years now, um, I'm especially thrilled to have Vladimir here in person with us today. So please join me in welcoming Vladimir Redutny. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Um, thank you for inviting me here and to share my thoughts and work. Um, preparing this lecture and giving the talk today has been pretty hard for me. I'm, um, I'm from the part of the world that's currently um, being destroyed by a madman, and it's uh, it's a it's pretty hard um, knowing that your birthplace and the place you came from is is being erased, especially being an architect and somebody who creates and wants to improve uh, the spaces that you know we're focused on. But we need to stay optimistic, strong, and hope we can overcome and prevail this insanity. I, uh, I grew up and um, I was born in a city called Nikolaev. Uh, a lot of you start you know, watching the news, you start to understand the geography a little bit better of that region. But it's a small town. Um, comparatively, it's about six to 800,000 people um, near the, um, the Black Sea. It's near Odessa. But for me, the creativity and, and kind of the desire uh, to be a creator or, or somebody who was interested in arts started there. Um, uh, specifically with my grandfather, uh, who was also an artist. And I was around the, the kind of the creative atmosphere growing up. My mom also sent me to an art school where I learned how to draw and, and paint. So I, I, I had some foundation of understanding what, what the art world is, is about. And uh, growing up, that was always part of my foundation. Um, however, my realization that I uh, wanted to make things and, and, and actually build things didn't start until uh, I started studying architecture at University of Illinois. Um, I attended that school uh, for both my undergrad and graduate degrees. I traveled quite a bit abroad. I, I was exposed to architecture uh, primarily in Europe and I, I, I sort of fell in love with the profession um, after always wanting to do something creative. And while I was at U of I, I, I did a couple um, studies abroad in one particular was um, experiences with uh, contemporary walls and what you see on the screen here is, is, is interpretive models that I put together uh, while traveling. I, I selected five buildings. Uh, one of them was the Jewish uh, Museum in Berlin and I would build these really interesting kind of intricate models using materials that I've never uh, tried in the past to kind of evoke a certain uh, quality and a certain emotion that I was uh, 
uh, experiencing. And then I put an exhibit um, at school for people to, to see and, and share my work. And then I was also very fortunate while I was in school uh, to have been in the right place in the right time um, where somebody from an apostolic life church came into the uh, computer lab and they were asking if any student would be able to help them design a baptistry and an altar. And one of the uh, students pointed in my direction saying that he could help you out um, because I, I, I was sort of known as a guy that just liked to make things and you know, kind of was a creative person um, because the, the graduate program has multiple tracks. There's a design track, there's a practice track, a structures track. I was on the design track. So um, I met with these people and I came up with an idea uh, of of something that was metaphorically uh, relevant where hands of man and hands of God sort of come together. And uh, the altar is the focal point. But what was interesting to me at, at the time, I, I was really focused on kind of the visual perception of, of seeing things and, and how spaces uh, and elements and materials can sort of change your, your viewing. And in this particular example, the, the walls are at different heights and, and they're sort of converging to kind of force your uh, visual perception of perspective, sort of forcing that perspective towards the center. Um, this was an interesting project because also uh, I was sort of spoiled by it where you know, I, I proposed this idea, they said, great, let's do it. And then I gave them a model and some schematic drawings and then a couple of weeks later, it was done. So I was actually inhabiting my model which was pretty impressive that you know, I've never experienced that in the past. But it also taught me a lot and gave me some bravery that, you know what, it doesn't have to be that complicated. You just have to be convincing and, and sort of understand how things work. And then while I was in school, I was continuing to design things. I was really interested in not just purely coming up with ideas and drawings, but I actually wanted to see them and physically touch them. So this was a table that I designed that, that, that still works. It's a table based on you know, kind of a simple idea. It's based on my pet bird. It's kind of funny, but that's where it started. But I wanted to kind of have this one continuous line that was folded to become a table, and I wanted to hang off the wall and sort of become the sculptural element in space. Um, and then I also des uh, designed a, a necklace uh, for my girlfriend, but now my wife, and um, I just wanted to uh, obviously impress her. But I, I was actually curious, you know, how can you take a material that uh, that can transform itself from a round? Uh, or a curvilinear line into something that's more flat and something that could uh, go from one shape to another. So in plan, you can see how it goes from a curve to a single line, and then in section, you can see the same thing where it goes from a tube to a more of a flat surface. And when the two come together, there's a, there's a moment of, of, of sort of echoing that, which is uh, integrating a piece of amber. This was one of my favorite um, impulsive designs and um, executions that I did while literally I was you know, on summer break in my parents' house. It was a handrail. Uh, my father and I were putting an addition to my house, so I was learning you know, a lot of things, but uh, this was something I saw at a flower store. And I saw a piece of birch, and I thought, oh, this could be a handrail. It's perfect size. It, you, know, you can touch it, and you know, it's a surprise, and it can become, again, a sculpture forever. Um, it, it, 20 plus years later, it's still hanging there, and it's it's it's, it's great, especially if most of you have, you know, if you've touched the birch tree, how silky and smooth that, that, that skin of the bark actually is. Um, what I didn't really realize until now, kind of going back, is you know, how much I was actually learning uh, because, you know, materials behave in different ways, um, understanding how things are put together, understanding where to source things, um, how much time things take. Those things I took for granted back then because I, you know, it was all new. It was all a learning experience. But now, you know, becoming an architect and, and working, you, you have that knowledge. You kind of gone through that rigor, and it was happening at that time without, you know, kind of realizing it. And to me, this was, you know, this is something that that's invaluable. And then right after school, uh, because I've I've studied abroad a couple times, one in Versailles for a year, and then also an exchange program program in Munich, I was a student all the time. So I wanted to actually experience Europe and, and that world kind of, you know, as, as somebody who actually lives there. So I, we moved in 2002 uh, to London to work, live, travel. And while living in London, you know, 
know, I, I needed another creative outlet, and making things was, was one just not as easy because the resources, not knowing where and how. But I, I found this you know, outlet through documentation, and the documentation I I, I did was I, I discovered and noticed something that is rather beautiful, and and something that I didn't really pay attention to when I was in Europe the first few times, and it's scaffolding. And London was littered with scaffolding, and littered in, in a good way. You know, I, I saw something that I called temporary permanence because it was always there, but it was disappearing um, as as you know as, as these, some of these facades were being repaired. So scaffolding was used to repair the exterior of these buildings that, because they're they're all landmarked, essentially these buildings will never disappear, um, and they need upkeep. So the scaffolding will also never disappear. But they're rather beautiful structures, and there's different conditions because there's different scales of buildings, different facades, and um, you know they use color for fabric. Um, they are different heights, different scale, different moments in time. And to me, you know, I was seeing London through a slightly different lens, and I was sharing this with my friends who I would take out a stack of photographs. Nothing was digital then, and you know, kind of bore them for 45 minutes of like, look how cool some of these things are. You know. This is to me. This is truly architecture, where you know it, it, there's beauty there. There's there's minimal kind of materiality use, um, and it's 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 very functional. But you know, there's something uh, rather uh, surprising where the two juxtapositions occur of something solid and something more uh, lightweight. Um, in the back of all these buildings, um, there's different conditions because the, the backs of well, the facades, they use more of a common brick, but they also need repairs and they also need to be able to be accessed. So you see different type of uh, scaffolding and the juxtaposition of more of the similar tones and colors. More moments of, you know, the, the, the wrapping essentially is, is to prevent dust from coming out of the, the work area or, or debris from falling from different areas, but from the outside, you're seeing it com completely different conditions. In these few slides, you, this becomes more structure. There's bridges that are created. There's balconies that are created. Again, these are all scaffolding. This is all you know, a certain type of assembly that ultimately becomes um, the structure and, and architecture. Uh, the slide on the left, I really like because of the, the, the end condition that, that you see, kind of these floating, almost shelf-like elements that are suspended in space. And then you start seeing the peeling of the skin, which is the, the wrap of the, the green fabric. Again, these are all architectural terminologies that I use now in my work, but I sort of interpret them when I was seeing these things. Different scales, and this is across River Thames, you see this building cloaked suddenly it transforms itself. And then on the right, you see a different condition again along a pretty prop, uh, dominant um, street, which is uh, King's Cross. Um, this was probably one of the last projects that Oscar Niemeyer, he's a Brazilian architect, uh, probably one of the greatest of the last century. Um, so this was a uh, pavilion that was done in Hyde Park, but they, again, they used scaffolding to erect this structure, which I found quite interesting because it's a brand new building or brand new temporary building, and they're using temporary elements to actually build it. A detail that I find absolutely beautiful of this joint of two things coming together and then being held by this condition. I'd have a hundred more of these images and I could probably do a lecture on just this, but um, I wanted to share these um, because it, to me it's important to sort of not necessarily lay foundation, but to sort of explain that you know creativity doesn't necessarily have to be purely about making buildings or spaces, there's outlets that, that, that exist that if we're just able to pay attention to things around us, be able to focus on them, observe, you know, they, those things end up somehow influencing you and also becoming part of who you are and what you do. So in 2008, um, I established my own practice after working for a few years in Chicago. Um, I worked for Perkins and Will, and then I worked for Crick and Sexton Architects. Um, Crick and Sexton um, is a smaller office, but um, there were two partners, Mark Sexton and, and Ron Crick. They were um, uh, essentially disciples of Mies van der Rohe, and uh, Mies suddenly became sort of part of my life in, in, in the literal sense, where I was working in the Mies building. I was uh, also living in the Mies building um, because my wife and I bought a condo in uh, one of the uh, high-rises, the 880 building, and then I was also uh, working under um, 
the, the Misian disciples of uh, Mark Iran. So suddenly this, this new language that I really wasn't introduced to in school uh, became part of my life and I, I became sort of obsessed with, with, the, with it in, in the sense where, you know, even though people think Mies is, is someone who is extremely uh, technical and minimal, but uh, he's also uh, uh, an artist in the way he saw things and, and the perception of, of how buildings are, are perceived or how they're looked at, how spaces are understood it is not necessarily purely about how they are actually put together. It's, it's, it's an idea of being able to see uh, more than what's apparent. And this idea, these, these visual kind of uh, interests that I've had since school started to become part of uh, most of our work um, now. And, and, and this was a project that I did, uh, a renovation of my apartment, that attests a, a lot of these ideas. So um, the plan, the, the two plans on the right, those are the, the floor plans of, of the unit that we bought. It was about 780 square feet. But these are uh, spaces that are pretty compartmentalized um, uh, if nobody renovated them. So they're subdivided in order to accommodate the life of you know, whoever is inhabiting. But I wanted to actually see what happens if you open everything up and how you start to divide them in a minimal way. Um, and one of the things I wanted to try is, is, is understanding glass and reflectivity. And um, so I. I, I created this this monolithic kind of flooring um, approach to the space where at nighttime the floor just starts to extend itself out out of the unit uh, because glass acts more as a reflector. Um, and then I also want to, to figure out what happens you know, of, of how people view your, your space from the outside because it's a high rise, it's pretty dense. So these are some sketches and some you know little uh, renderings that I did quickly for myself and then the, the plan kind of explains the new organization. I had friends who I went to school with, my father who, who helped me out with, um, with building out and renovating the apartment. Um, these are a few details just to share kind of how materials could start share, sharing that. Um, the visual connectivity where the, the exterior and the background is the mullions uh, of, the, uh, of the exterior wall and then the partition starts to take on the same kind of articulation but for different reasons. Um, the thickness of the material could be broken into two parts so it doesn't appear as visually heavy uh, because it's wood and um, wood needs more thickness in order for it to, to, to work. I use clear glass to kind of work with uh, continuity allowing the material to flow through and the uh, translucent glass to give you a little more privacy. Um, I continued making things. I made the island in the space I separated the two volumes so you can see the wall beyond, again, not allowing your eye to continue and seeing things past their initial point. Um, thickness is, is interesting to me, and how do you break the thickness down? So the five-inch wall, which is a typ typical stud wall, you know, if you layer it in different uh, thicknesses, you can see that in the back here, uh, where two layers of exterior material in, in laid with, with another material. Um, starts to visually look thinner and smaller. I built vanities uh, for our space. One, because we, I, I wasn't even sure where you source things at that point when I was starting out, but I was also interested in, in kind of fabricating stuff. So this was a CNC made um, stand. But what's interesting about this project, it, it's not necessarily the fact that there's a lot of ideas that were tested, uh, which was obviously important to me, but um, Again, I learned a lot from this, and, and what I really learned from this is, is, is that you can't do everything yourself, and you kind of have to rely on trades and other people that are, um, that are able to, to be part of your world of, of, of creativity and, and output. So learning you know, how to lay tile, how to do drywall, how to even paint properly, and like the understanding what, what type of paint and, and, the, and the type of brushes to use. A lot of this was learning and testing and sort of experimenting on myself, which now I'm Try not to experiment, experiment on my clients. Um, fast forward um, to 2013, uh, you know, after finishing that project and living in that apartment, uh, we had two kids and we had to move out. Uh, but during the time we were selling that apartment, um, we had quite a few people go through and, and some people actually hired us to do their projects, even though they didn't buy the apartment because they really liked the space that we created. Um, so. That yielded a lot more work and sort of started to build a portfolio of clientele 
base of what we do. Um, and then in 2013, I received a call from a gentleman who, uh, Crick and Sexton, who I used to work for, recommended us because the project was too small for them. So they said, why don't you talk to Vlad and you know, he can probably um, help you out. So um, we got a call and, and this was also a very exciting call because suddenly I, I was able to get a project in, um, in 880 building, but now with a budget and a client. And um, this is a very different space, and it's a corner space. So you can see on the left, this is the unit. And what's interesting about the corner units in the 860, 880 buildings is that um, they're a little bit more awkward, where they're, you know, they're strange in how they're laid out. Like the kitchen is in the bottom. It's pretty dark. You have these sort of narrow uh, corridors. You have these subdivided spaces. And you know something that you wouldn't necessarily think is Miesian, in, 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 in reality, it's actually not Miesian. It was more developer-based. Um, outcome for a plan. So we wanted to see can we sort of rethink this this layout in a way that could be more appropriate for how Mies thought or how the buildings possibly could, could be uh, looked at or the spaces. So we took the bedroom, the, the, the sleeping area, and we put it to this section. And the reason we did that is because the lake is actually towards this side. So we placed the living room or the living space opening up to the to the lakefront. And then the next thing that I wanted to sort of continue is this idea of you know, visual perception and what does that mean in the context of this project. So there's this term called phenomenal transparency um, that I wanted to explore. And the phenomenal transparency as a term is basically you know, things that you know, visually connect or continue. Um, they don't physically act that way. Like you're seeing things as they move through space, through objects, but they physically don't do that. So some of these diagrams start to show that where we wanted this edge of the space to feel like it's one, we wanted this edge of the space to feel like it's one. Um, and then, you know, start reinforcing those with cabinetry. You can see this as a one gesture and there's, these are folding. These shelves start to continue across the spaces. Uh, we put diagrams together, we built models. Um, this is I would say study model, but it was more of a finished model to not just you know study the ideas, but also be able to convey them to the client. Because you can talk about things and you can describe them, but until you're actually able to communicate that in a way that somebody fully understands, it's hard to convince them to actually buy into your logic, your ideas. So models are a big tool in the way we practice and the way we work, because models are something that we can both see and understand together. Construction is is a big um, part of my my life. I absolutely love being an architect for that purpose, to be able to visit job sites um, and seeing the past where things are taken out and then seeing how things are assembled. So this is the space above that what we saw first time and then the below is it being sort of disassembled and you can see the footprint or the, the plan of the walls imprinted on the ceiling. A few images of construction. Um, how things are assembled, just kind of the beauty of the organization, the, the clarity of how things come together. The slide on the right shows a tile setter who uh, suggested, and this is, this is purely his, it was his suggestion because he saw the, the design we were after. Well, he said, you know, you can remove the thickness of material by mitering the corners of, of it and, and be able to put it together in such a way that it feels more monolithic and you don't see the edges. Ever since we've been using that strategy pretty much for all of our tile and anything that we fold when it comes to a solid surface. So we learn again, every project is a learning experience to improve yourself, but also improve how you design. Um, these are a few images of the finished product. Uh, this is uh, looking at the entry now of that space. Here's that um, the space that, that you saw in the model. And this is the visual perception that I was describing where you can see the wood wall sort of stitching through that space but it stops where that white wall is. In the background you can see that millwork piece that I was describing or that cabinet that it sort of punctures through the column but it, it feels like it's one. And one of the reasons to do that is also to unify that space because the column sort of creates an edge, creates a stopping point. But by cutting through it and integrating into a space it feels more unified and like cohesive. Here's that view again of you seeing that wall cutting through the space into the kitchen start seeing these shelves wrapping themselves around the corner and you'll see that in the next slide. 
We also did some interesting things with that wall where the wall actually transforms and it hides the closets behind in a way that the doors actually start to have dual function where it closes the bathroom off from, you know, for privacy purposes. No, the spaces are pretty dark and light is a kind of a common thread and, 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 and something that's really important in our, in our practice and how we think and, and approach spaces. So this was not, not, not that much different, but what we tried in here is you know, in order to get light deeper into the space where uh, the kitchen is, where I initially said it was pretty dark and disconnected, we actually used the shower as this device to get light um, into that kitchen and be able to connect back through the, the bathroom towards the lake. So we created this electrochromatic glass as this privacy glass um, that could turn opaque or clear based on you know, the use of that room, but it still allows light through. But this is a, obviously a surprise, you know, trying to convince somebody, hey, you can have a bathroom that, that is completely you know, open. Um, but um, it worked. I mean, you know, client is, is a big factor in, in successful projects. So he bought into the idea, and obviously it, it functions, and it still functions to the day. Um, some more images of, of the interior. Um, those are the shelves that are you know, hovering, and, and you saw the, the construction of them, these stainless steel bent plates that are coming out of the wall. Um, the bed, we designed all the millwork. Um, we try to thin out our walls even further. You can see how thin the actual partition is. It's a half inch glass. Uh, we used a gradient um, sandblasted uh, uh, finish on the glass where the privacy occurs at the bottom and then it's more transparent above. So when you're standing, you're able to see and perceive the entire space. Also beauty of glass, it's reflectivity. You know, be able to start to mix these reflections and viewing and kind of this interesting space. At the same time, we, um, we got this project, which is an interesting uh, kind of relationship that I've had with a client, uh, where when we began our office, I, uh, I wanted to work with him because he was probably one of the few that was doing uh, contemporary uh, residential projects in Chicago. And at the time, it was 2008, and as most of you know, um, that's when the economy sort of was collapsing, and that was our you know, great recession. So nobody was building, and you know, he wasn't going to give us a project at that time, but we stayed on his radar. Um, through the recession and then 2013 he called and, and asked if we would be willing to work on his office. So this was a, uh, he owned this entire like complex, basically a, a building and there's another building adjacent to it and there's another building here which he runs but there was this black box essentially um, on the outside that he was running an office out of. Um, so you can see they're still working during the demo phase uh, but the it was just a super kind of you know, enclosed bunker with these, I don't know what the spaces were used originally, but there was just these leftover uh, rooms that um, they, they weren't really using for anything. And there was this garage dividing these two spaces that, you know, he wanted to take advantage of to expand his office. So we, we thought of this project in a way of sort of editorial approach, and not additive, where we start to remove things. Um, so thinking about just taking stuff out and kind of bringing it to the raw quality of, of what the space could be. We cleaned it all up and then we introduced this, what we call the binding wall. This thing that looks like the snaking uh, uh, black line on, in plan, but in, in, in 3D and kind of this axonometric view, you see it more as a sculpted uh, meandering um, divider that basically integrates program into it and, and starts to divide spaces, but also connect them. And that was really important because you have these different zones, but how do you make them feel more as one and kind of this, this one cohesive um, organization? So from a program standpoint, we gave this space um, as this use in one operation, and then we gave this space uh, more of a kind of a privacy for his office and also a conference table. Um, at the same time, again, the ideas of you know, visual perception and seeing things and how do you work with materials. Moray is also an interesting kind of um, a concept where you take two materials that have similar patterns and by overlapping them you create this beautiful sort of pattern and this pattern is pretty dynamic so if you move you see fences on the roads when there's patterns that are overlaid they're, they're, they're sort of moving with you so we tried that idea in this project and um, and those those uh, the, those things became uh, screens and also supporting elements for the desks so in these four slides, you kind of see the sequence of construction where you know, that old space was cleaned up. You 
know, we cleaned the brick up, we opened up the walls, uh, we brought back the, the joys to life, um, and then we start to assemble the, all of the, the new elements. So the new elements, you know, they were built, I'm thinking of them a little bit more raw as well, so there's a nice kind of complement to the existing, but also creating enough juxtaposition where the two are, are working against each other. And here is the space um, assembled. So these are these massive screens in, in length. So they're about 10 feet long by about uh, six foot tall. The idea was that you know, when you're standing up, you still feel like you're enclosed. But this pattern that's created is literally just two layers of half inch perforated uh, openings. And the interesting thing about it is you know, you're basically removing about 60% of the material weight. And through removal, the material gets lighter, but it doesn't lose its strength. And by taking the two materials and overlapping them, suddenly they become this beautiful you know, outcome. And the desks we, we designed and we built them out of MDF plywood. Um, so they were integrated into it. So they needed each other in order to support. And you can see how thin the structure actually is relative to the thickness of the desk. This view here is, is what you see when you walk right into this office. He collects cars. So the cars became sort of on display as part of the, the, you know, the experience of that place. Um, another detailed view of you know, seeing this layering that occurs with the materials and overlapping. Um, this is the that binding wall that I was describing. You can see this, uh, these ideas of phenomenal transparency being sort of carried through the projects of things cutting through and, and reappearing on the side. Another interesting moment here is this desk. You know, from certain vantage points, this desk appears like it's sliding through the space, but in reality it's not. But you know, the way it's articulated, it's, it's trying to suggest that, again, bringing spaces together so they don't feel so subdivided. This is his actual office, and we introduced this aperture here that uh, sort of was this window that, again, allows you to connect to the space beyond. And something that, you know, sort of becoming a common thread in a lot of work, um, orientation uh, in terms of uh, apertures and light, um, trying to achieve at least three or four orientations in each space, which is pretty challenging, but also becomes sort of a, a way to think, like how do you do that? So in this case, you get four apertures or four orientations within the room. Um, this is uh, the, the last slide of this project where it, it shows the, you know, what the exterior now looks like. You know, we also did some landscaping, but the, the openings are much bigger, and you're seeing the activity inside. Um, at about the same time that we finished that project, and maybe a year on or less than a year, we, we were asked to do an office for two attorneys in the, in the, in the uh, Fulton Market. And this is an interesting project because it, it, you know, it had the similar questions of, of the previous one. Of, you know, what do you do with this raw space? How do you deal with this kind of time capsule? And um, you know, it was a much bigger space. It was about 4,000 square feet, where the other one was 1,000 square feet. So the initial images that, that I'm, I'm showing you here is what we saw when we walked in. And, and the impressions were, well, you have this beautiful space on the top floor. You have these beautiful views, and then you have this massive footprint. How do you get light deeper into the space? Um, how do you see out? Um, how do you make sure that people working there you know, don't feel like they're secondary citizens to the people that actually occupy the perimeter. So those are the questions that we initially thought. And then, you know, if you can see here, you know, the approach was, you know, ductwork just sort of hangs in space, lighting sort of hangs in space. You sort of forget that you're even this beautiful loft building that, you know, has been there for over 100 years. So, you know, start asking these questions, you know, how do you get light deeper into a space? How do people start to connect to the outside? And how do they feel like they're, you know, they're part of the whole versus being just, you know, workers. And then how do you really highlight the beauty of, of the loft? And those were the three questions that we were trying to answer through, you know, a simple kind of diagram of organization. And we came up with a strategy of taking these walls and sort of starting to weave them through the existing structure. And that became the, the, the direction for the, for the project. And the walls, as you can see this slide with the shadows, that's, that's something we really wanted to see, achieve is these large apertures are able to bring light through, through those apertures deeper into the space and create these really unique shadows on the interior. So this is the plan um, and an axon again to explain how we essentially uh, organize the space. But what, one thing I wanted to highlight here is the perimeter. 
the perimeter we try to keep open and free as much as possible. And the reason for that is, again, so you don't feel like you have these compartmentalized individual spaces, but no matter where you are in the space, you're, you're able to see the continuity of, of the existing walls. So we located the two partner offices at this side here, and then we created this uh, lounge space in between where they can connect, but also people are able to come directly into it. And um, um, we, we recycled some of the existing windows from the, from the original layout, and we reused them to enclose some of these other spaces in order to kind of keep that visual continuity. Um, a few you know, images of construction where you're seeing the existing space sort of transform. We painted the ceilings white and we introduced a different lighting strategy of these sort of linear fixtures that were part of the existing grain that is the ceiling. And then by painting the ceilings, we really started to highlight the actual structure, the structure that is quite beautiful and, and aged well. Uh, we, uh, we also lightened the floor a little bit. We used maple floor instead of what was there, you know, again, to, to make everything lighter, to brighten the spaces. You can see this window. This is the reused window that, um, that we reclaimed from the original building. Uh, here's a few end results where you walk into the space and suddenly these walls really feel like they're weaving in and out and kind of guiding you through the rooms. Uh, the apertures are quite big. They're, they vary in size, but they're about six to seven feet in width. And we use columns to actually divide some of these apertures. So, like, you know, that opening here is, I would say, about six feet. So by, play, by keeping the column or adjusting the opening where it needed to, you know, it sort of divided that entry point into two. Again, columns became dividers, but they also became connectors. Um, this was an interesting kind of moment where the column actually is on the interior of this space, but then above it actually punctures out. So again, kind of stitching those spaces vertically. Images and views, again, the connectivity and kind of this continuity of the base becoming the frame for the apertures and then coming down and then going across keeps this common thread in the line, keeping the, the, the organization sort of together as a whole. Um, this is that lounge that I was describing um, where the column sort of bifurcates the space in half. Um, another interesting moment in the project, um, we. Uh, with that middle zone that I was uh, describing earlier as sort of the dark space. We placed the kitchenette on the backside, and this is where some of the paralegals are and some of the admins, so they're faced towards the outside, so they're able to see through these large apertures or these large openings towards the outside, so they're able to see through spaces. But then we introduced this, this workhorse, this volume, as a divider, as a screen, as a backdrop. And because it's such a big object, um, the fear was that this is going to look like something massive in the space. So what we, we, we came up with was this idea of, you know, what if we you know, sort of suggest that it's actually suspended from the ceiling with these cables. In reality, those cables are actually just guide wires for the plants to grow. Again, we wanted to introduce some life and something that's constantly changing in the space where, you know, this, this screen gets fuller as time goes on. But again, it, it visually gives you this lightness. Um, by literally just elevating this thing on, on something that, you know, that's sort of pushed back and, and, and suggesting something else. These are the offices, the partner's offices. We hung their desks from the top, again, to kind of continue with the stuff that's already happening on the ceiling, you know, instead of placing um, your typical feet or legs for the elements. This is those windows that I was describing earlier where you can see through the series of openings. Uh, which was the strategy on the perimeter. This is the other partner's office. His was a little bit lighter than the other partner. So these large glass enclosures were also utilized as writing boards so they can actually you know, take notes and uh, kind of activate the space and make it a little bit more dynamic. Shadows were a huge factor in considering this project from day one. So this was a fixture uh, by Tom Dixon, which I really like, just the simplicity of it. But we, we, we hung it in the space that the wall now became this canvas to absorb the shadows. So you have this bulb that essentially emitting this pattern on the surface. Um, these are just a few moments that I was describing of you know, the ivy growing, this double layer of wire, um, these beautiful shadows that are cast on these white walls. So the walls are just absorbing this, this exterior as the light and, and the sun moves through. And then some writing that on the glass.
this again, just to kind of highlight and explain how interesting that is, because you have a white surface behind it, suddenly you have depth that's occurring. Um, and for the last project, I'll, I'll show you probably our biggest project to date in terms of uh, its size. And this is a um, this is the project that we did uh, that was completed a few years ago uh, with the developer that we did the office for. And this is a uh, multifamily building. Uh, we call it 2016 Rice Project. It's in Ukrainian village, and uh, it's it's. It's, it was a first for us, and it was kind of nerve-wracking because we've never done a building before. Uh, we've done a house, which is quite different than you know, designing for multiples and, and designing uh, for, for a developer for profit. And we had this lot that uh, was there's a corner lot right on the alley, and uh, they wanted to fit eight units in there. And um, so, you know, this is Lakefront. That's Chicago Avenue. This is where the site is. You can see it context. So you have these small, low-profile buildings um, around it. The, we did a lot of studies, so these are kind of the finished iteration or the finished you know, organization. But we came up with this idea of what if these could be individual kind of units that are sort of configured in a way that, you know, that makes this building feel as a whole, but then each person gets their own dwelling in, in the sense that it could feel like theirs. It's, it's, it's unlike you know, living in the building that has multiple apartments. And um, we came up with a strategy of this puzzle kind of organization uh, because we wanted to have uh, duplexes, or they wanted to have duplexes and simplexes as part of the strategy. Um, so you can see this like puzzle, Tetris-like uh, approach of these individual units that are similar at, at, at different levels, but um, they're just rotated and flipped. So that was fun for you know, mechanical um, strategy and also structural strategy. Um, and the way the building works is that you have two entry points, one here and one here. And that would allow people to, to come from different points um, into their units without uh, necessarily needing to go through the central kind of entry all the time. So there's some individuality and separation that occurs, yet there's some commonality as well. And in the back, we carved out these outdoor spaces that essentially connect the, the units at the lower level. We also sloped the, the front a little bit in order to get more light to some of these, which you rarely see. Um, typically, develop a project, you, you, know, you try to minimize them out of openings. But you know, in order to, for these to be more desirable, we wanted to, to, to activate them with light. So these are some floor plans to kind of show you how the units work. So this is one unit here. This is another unit. So this box here actually overlaps the space here. So they're, they're, they're individually shown, but they're, they're stacking. And then these here are the top units um, that essentially are identical. They're just rotated and flipped. Um, there's four of those, and then there's two of these, and there's two of these. Um, and then once we figured out this diagram, this part T, what was interesting is that the client just didn't understand how the building worked. Like, he just couldn't figure out how this thing is going to actually work. Like, where are the stairs? How do you get in and out? And I had the same heart, uh, I had the same problem with uh, trying to convey that to the city because they just couldn't get it. They couldn't understand that you can have two egresses, two means of getting out, two means of coming in at any given point. Um, and that was, that was a challenge. I had to sit down with a building commission and basically walk them through the project. And he understood, and we essentially worked together to get this thing permitted because there's, it was it was going to be a nightmare um, because it was somewhat atypical. Um, and then we studied the, the the exterior, and the exterior sort of came out of two directions. One, how do you thin out the wall? How do you make the wall thin because it's a masonry building? That's what they wanted, and also because of the fire ratings and the size. Uh, the other thing I, I really was interested in: how do you make this thing dynamic again? I, like I. I as you have seen or heard, you know, st static is rarely used in, in my vocabulary. So dynamic, like how does that work? And we thought that the metal exterior facade could do that for us. Why? Because um, metal has reflectivity. It could change, you know, throughout the time, um, you know, morning, afternoon, evening, seasons. But also you have this, you know, this, this undulation that, uh, you know, kind of gives depth when the, when the light hits it. So, you know, we looked at different colors, different finishes, it's long lasting, but it's also super thin. So from a developer standpoint, you know, by putting a th super thin material outside of the building and cloaking it, you're essentially giving them so much square footage. So that was a good selling point. So I took it from two directions. I can, you know, you get more building and I get my dynamic facade. So that was, that 
was that worked. Uh, we showed some renderings, kind of, you know, we showed the fall season, like how this thing could start to look this way, and the evening house could start to look this way, and it worked. You know, this, these were um, ways to explain how the building, you know, could function. The windows were really interesting, um, how they were configured. So once we planned the building, we started to put holes where we wanted those holes to occur. So it wasn't sort of random, but, you know, start to think about it. You know, if you have a corridor and you have a, a space you're walking through, what do you see beyond that point? And then through that strategy, we start thinking, okay, can some windows start to suggest what's, what's actually programmed behind? So the larger square windows became more living, living spaces because they're more public and you don't necessarily need to open them and, and, and have operability, where the other windows actually became all operables. So that became this organization for the exterior. Um, and then we grouped them, organized them, so it, it feels more cohesive. Some construction images, you know, the site actually once it took down three buildings were it was massive and it was a huge surprise. Uh, this, this emptiness and that occurred once the, the buildings were extracted. And some masonry conditions, um, as the building was growing out of the ground, there was a lot of steel uh, in the building to, to make those, that configuration work. And then they had some drone shots to show what this thing looks like. It was quite beautiful just to see this masonry box uh, take shape. A um, few construction images, I absolutely love this. Uh, you, know, they, you know, some guys just came up with a handrail detail. And I, Definitely going to employ that one day into probably some project, but I just love that that surprise. Tubes just held together by some welds. That's the scale of our windows. This is Fanny Hotan who who works with me. Uh, we went to the job site, you know, having fun. Um, and here's the outcome of the project. Um, you can see the you know, the renderings and the models sort of become real. Um, you can see the material again and how it's all organized. The windows and how it starts to become this new neighbor in context. Um, you can see how you know, the light changes its exterior. Um, the corner is actually quite interesting. You know, we have these large spaces that are dedicated for outdoor space that became this sort of communal dialogue between neighbors. Uh, but we also um, sort of thought, that, you know, why can't the front be the back, the back being the front? You know, these uh, fire stairs now become um, elements that you that you see and you, you visually engage with. More details of entries. That's the back of the building, which to me is also front. It doesn't really have a front or back as a, as a logic. You can see how the skin changes. This is morning view. You can see the sunrise and sort of reflecting on the exterior of the building. The views of all these outdoor spaces, the balcony at the top, the terrace, and then those wells below. So now, you know, people are still able to sort of visually connect and communicate. A few views of individual units. We used open grading for the stairs. I wanted to create sort of a sense of suspension as if you're coming down. I thought it would be kind of interesting, but also you don't have this darkness above your head. You, you know, you get light coming through. Um, some interior spaces, common corridors. Um, they're pretty raw uh, in terms of their materiality, but it's also a multifamily building that you know is going to be able to take the abuse. These are the views from the interior of one of the units. So you can see these large openings kind of framing the exterior. And these are two images of the lower units in the duplexes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.